This is the Holy Gospel of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, according to John. Glory to you, Lord Christ. This is John chapter 13, beginning at the 31st verse. When Judas was gone, Jesus said, Now the Son of Man is glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will glorify the Son in himself, and will glorify him at once. My children, I will be with you only a little longer. You will look for me, and just as I told the Jews, so now I tell you, where I'm going, you cannot come. A new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. In the name of God, of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. Seeds are amazing things, aren't they? Seeds, uh, they are, they look um, so unassuming, so so normal. They just, they look like a, a little pebble or a, or a little piece of dirt. You'd never think that there was anything special about them. And yet, uh, given the right conditions, given the soil um, that was uh, that was fertile, and given water and sunlight, uh, a seed grows. You could never tell from the look of a seed what that seed would grow into, but all of a sudden, it's it becomes from this little thing. It becomes a a a a, a, a stand of corn, or it becomes a tree, or it becomes a a. a a tree like a, a mustard seed bush. You know, it's huge, big, uh, that's so in contrast with the little seed that's in it. Um, for us this morning, you know, we're in this season of Easter, and so we're, we're looking at Jesus with post-resurrection eyes, this Jesus who rose from the dead and now is spending this time with his disciples uh, helping them to wrap their brains around what it means for Jesus to have risen and for the implications for the rest of us as we live our lives. And, uh, and in this resurrection life, he plants seeds, his seed, deep inside of us. And it's really, it's really impossible for us to know where that seed will take us ultimately. Uh, it looks so unassuming, so simple. You could just brush it away, and yet as we allow that seed to come into us, and it germinates, and it begins to grow, it develops a life of its own in ways that are unexpected for us. And so Jesus, in the, in the gospel lesson for this morning, plants one of those seeds. Um, he's with his disciples. Um, as you remember, uh, this, uh, this passage, this event, is on the night he was betrayed. Um, and so he's there having his last supper uh, with his disciples. And Judas has just left them, gone out into the dark, we're told. And so then he says, uh, so now is the time for the Son of Man to be glorified. And so the, he, he gives to his disciples um, his new command, this new command that's different than any of the other commands that he'd given them, in, intensifies the command. And it is, um, the new command is for you to love one another as I have loved you. As I have loved you. Love one another as I have loved you. Making his love and the way that he treated the people around him um, the standard for how it is that we're to love. You know, in, in, uh, in the ancient civilizations, the rule for how we judged how people were supposed to interact with each other, was uh, don't do anything to anyone that you didn't want them to do to you, right? Uh, don't do anything to them if you that you didn't want done to you. So if you don't want to get slugged, don't slug somebody, 
sounds like what I used to teach my boys as I was raising them. If you don't want to, you don't want to you know, have somebody, you know, get mad at you and, and push you around, don't do that to them. So, because it comes back at you, right? So that was the old ancient civilization rule. And then, uh, and then Jesus taught us at the, at, at, during his, the Sermon on the Mount, he says, no, he says, uh, uh, treat one another as you would like to be treated. So it's not just about don't do something wrong, but do something right for other folks. So if you, if you want to be treated with love and respect, give love and respect to others. Um, it, treat each other with a standard of care that you would want to be treated. So it takes the second, the, it takes that first law and it, it kind of grows it. It makes it more difficult. So uh, I'm not thinking about just not how I can do harm to somebody else, but I'm thinking about now how I can do good to the other person because I want them to do good to me, right? So this is an, ad this is an, an advance, uh, a step above the moral rule that we'd had before. But now Jesus comes to this part of his life and he's saying, no, 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 he's, he's saying that's not enough. He's saying that's not enough. Um, now he's saying, I'm giving you a new command. I want you to, to love others as I have loved you. So what did Jesus do? for his followers. Well, he, he, he gave his life for his followers, right? Judas had just gone out into the dark. What was Jesus doing? What was the mark of his love? He was giving his life for his followers. So that now becomes the standard by which we judge our conduct with others. Not don't hurt them, and not do as you would like them to do to you, but do as Jesus did to you. Give your life for one another. Well, that's a, that's a big step forward. A hard step forward. In fact, who in our human life could do that? But the church has spent the rest of its time trying to figure out what it means for us to give ourselves as Jesus gave himself for us. And so we see then in the followers of Jesus, we see old standards and old barriers come crumbling down as we, as we realize these old walls and old hedges try to contain and restrain the love that God has for people who are outside of us. And, and the, the kingdom of Christ's love continues to expand. And so we see in the, in the first lesson for today, we see these, these so in, in, this, in, uh, in the season of Easter, we've been reading out of the Acts of the Apostles. Normally we read out of the Old Testament, but now in the season of Easter, we're reading out of the Acts of the Apostles who are in the aftermath of the resurrection of Jesus. And so, so now Peter, you know, up until this point, you know, the, the followers of Jesus have been essentially Jewish. They've been, they've been kind of contained within the Jewish community, and the assumption has been that they would have all of the dietary laws and all of the same restrictions about the Sabbath and all the same kinds of things that the, that the Jews had for themselves. But now Peter, um, in, this, in this account, is up uh, on the rooftop of a house, and, uh, and he's staying there waiting for his lunch to happen, and he, and he kind of falls into this, this time of prayer and, uh, and he sees this vision that comes down. And this, there's this tremendous tarp that comes down with all of these, all of these different kinds of animals. And, and the voice tells him to kill and eat. And he says, well, no, you know, we don't, I don't do that. I mean, I'm a, I'm a good Jew. I don't, I don't kill and eat. No gator tail for me, you know. We, can't, we don't eat those things. 
And so the, the, the sheet goes back into heaven, and then it comes back down. And, and the voice tells him, he says, well, don't call unclean what God has called clean. And, and it happens again a second time, and it happens a third time. And so now all of a sudden, Jesus or Paul, Peter is sitting there wondering, well, what does this mean? Now all of a sudden we can, we can eat food that we weren't supposed to eat before. Um, bacon, I just had a, Darla made a great BLT bacon, lettuce, and tomato sandwich. You know, it's just great bacon. So we can eat bacon now. We can eat, you know, food that we weren't supposed to eat before. And, uh, and then at that immediate time, um, some visitors come to join him. And they're coming from, uh, from the household of a Roman centurion who is curious about God and who has been, who is, who is these, these visitors have been sent to Peter to bring and asking Peter to come and bring the message of Jesus and the gospel to this Gentile house. And so Peter doesn't know what to do. He's never been in a Gentile house. He's never had a Gentile in his house. But now all of a sudden he invites these guests to come into this house and they have dinner together. And then he goes with them to this centurion's house. Now, he's a Roman centurion. These are enemies of his enemies. And, and he goes and he, he is, he's there with them. And he brings the gospel. And this centurion, this Roman centurion, becomes converted to the Christian gospel. And they eat together in this Gentile house. What did they have? I think it was a bacon, lettuce, and tomato sandwich. The first time Peter ever had bacon in his life. And, and, and all of a sudden, this, this, there's an earthquake that happens. There's an earthquake of, of this, this wall of separation that had always been that the people of God were simply this racially restricted group. And now, all of a sudden, the shaking of the foundations as the love of Christ begins to break out into areas that they never would have anticipated, never would have thought possible. This seed that Jesus had planted begins to grow and begins to show itself in new ways that were unanticipated. You know, we always, as we follow Jesus, he will shake our foundations. He will take us to places <clears throat> that we never thought possible, that we never even thought we wanted to go to. We will meet people that we never thought we would even want to have a conversation with. And we will be stretched in terms of our willingness and ability to love and to serve in ways that we never would have thought we would have wanted to go. You know, I grew up in a small town in Michigan, and it was uh, during the 1960s. And you remember the turmoil um, during the 1960s. And, uh, and my brother um, was, in the, uh, was serving in the National Guard, and he was called to serve down in Detroit during the, the race riots that happened down there. And, and, and he would come back. You know, in our town, there were, we were not, I mean, it was, a, it was a completely white town, and except for migrant workers that would come in seasonally to pick pickles uh, out in the fields. And, um, and so my brother would come back, and I can remember all kinds of racial epithets coming out of his mouth all kinds of things that he would say about folks who were um, racially different than him. And he was, he, was, he was essentially trying to restore order down in Detroit. Lots of anger and lots of resentment and lots of uh, just racial hatred. And uh, so as just a young boy, he was my idol. And I soaked in uh, a lot of that. And, uh, and yet it was as I began to go to college and began to meet people who were racially different from me all of a sudden, uh, uh, you know, God used them to be able to broaden my horizons, to be able to broaden a sense of, of how is it that God works and through whom does God work and how is it that God can use them to broaden me. And I remember after I was first ordained um, into the priesthood, I went back to Michigan and I was serving in this little church and, uh, and there was an African-American older woman, uh, Norma Allen was her name, and uh, she had just moved into the area, and uh, sweet as could be, and, uh, and she invited me uh, to come to her house to be able to visit just so that we could get to know each other. 
And, uh, and it dawned on me as I was going over, I had never been in the house of an African-American person before. And so, uh, so I was wondering, so what did, what did it look like? You know, what, how, how did she do things? What kinds of things? How was it different? And when I went into her house and she, uh, she brought me in, it was, um, so her house, what was amazing about her house was, um, was how similar it was to the house that I grew up in. Um, so kind of, so warm and welcoming. There were things, there were, there were symbols and marks of her African-American heritage, but warm and welcoming. And we, she invited me to sit down um, with her and we had a cup of coffee and she introduced me to Gavalia coffee and chocolate. Um, two loves that I've had ever since uh, that time. And I found a woman who was, uh, who was deeply compassionate and caring about her family and about the Christian community uh, that was all around us. I was so grateful for her and the gift that she brought to that little congregation and, and this to be able to feel in me because of her and because of others who had come before her, this growth of this seed, this, this breaking down of all barriers that, that had been so filled with with, uh, with hatred and division now all of a sudden coming down and this, this growth of a whole new opportunity, a whole new future for us as a community and hopefully um, as a nation as we continue to walk our way um, through, uh, through that calling. To be able to see this seed grow, um, love one another as I have loved you. The standard of Christ becomes the standard of his kingdom. And it takes us in places and develops into things that we had never thought possible. The, uh, the second lesson for this morning is this, is this beautiful lesson from the book of the Revelation to St. John. When, when finally there is a new heaven and a new earth and every tear is wiped away and all grief is gone, and death is defanged. And just a little bit later, it says that in that new heaven and a new earth, there's a tree. And that tree, it says, is a river um, coming down the center of the land. And it says, on each side of the river stood a tree, the tree of life, bearing 12 crops of fruit, yielding its fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. What a, what a wonderful and consoling and animating and, and, uh, and inviting place for God to take us. You know, I think we, we feel ourselves oftentimes on this journey towards what it is that God has for us. But every once in a while, we got to look at the end. We got to look at the end point of where it is that God's taking us. He's taking us to this place of this of this new heaven and a new earth where all tears are wiped away. Where as, as uh, St. Paul writes, he says, where there is no longer slave nor free, Jew nor Gentile, male nor female, but that we are all one in Christ. And he brings us to this tremendous place of his salvation where we can allow everything everything, all barriers, all boundaries to be breaking, broken down and his love, his light to be shining in us constantly and continuously made more and more and more and more and more and more into the people of God. And so for now, we've got a seed and that seed is growing in us. You'd never know that that's where we're headed because sometimes the seed in us feels uncomfortable. It raises questions. We don't know where it takes us. We don't know, we don't like the fact that some things that we hold you know, for security are, are breaking down. And yet this opportunity to be able to, to trust the presence of God's kingdom and this, this vocation, this calling that we have to be his people and to love one another as he has loved us, to allow ourselves to wash the feet of one another, to be this servant kingdom 
that God has called us to be. And so, to set us free.